We are definitely live. We are back. Well, kind of back. We are back. <laughs> they don't know we're back. <laughs> so, beloved listener, we recorded a fantastic episode for you last week. We just didn't record it onto anything. We hit record and we spoke for an hour, but it didn't go anywhere. Who, do you got, who should we blame? I was going to say, whose fault is it? You or CJ? Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> Ooh, ownership. I yeah. like it. I like the ownership. <laughs> You're <laughs> fine. <laughs> Doesn't bring that podcast back, but... Uh. <laughs> no, I think we were all so excited to just sit down and actually do this that there was a minor oversight. Gave us a good drive on though, right? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Anyway... This is the first episode, officially then, of the long format uh, Zero podcast. We're proudly sponsored by Establishment Coffee Co. Use the code Zero25 for 25% off and free shipping. The shitty thing about not having the episode last week was that we spoke about so much stuff that we didn't know about each other. Like CJ told a mad story that we'd never heard before. So maybe we'll re-record it one day and act surprised. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of weird now. Oh, dear. Um, so, a few big things happening for Zero. We're, uh, we're running the APL Queensland States. We've got 120 lifters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. over two days. Yes. Um, which is four flights each day, two sessions. Um, that's going to be the biggest comp that Zero's ever run at Zero. I've run a bigger comp. I've run um, – I ran the GPC Nationals – uh, like the Masters equipped bench only, deadlift only nationals in 2016, I think, which had 150 lifters. Uh, but this is the biggest meet we've run at the gym, so it's going to be pretty crazy. So we're going to do a few different things. We've got a new massive sound system that will be hopefully installed by then, which will lift that up a notch instead of the old boom box. Um, we're going to move out a bunch of the equipment, hopefully hire a bunch of chairs, have a better seating arrangement, have a better warm up room. Just try and make things a little bit more schmick. It'll definitely be our best comp we've ever hosted. I think so. I think so. It's going to be a lot of fun. You guys excited? Very. So pumped. Amazing. All right, James. Sweet. What are we starting with? I forgot. You're the boss. All right. This um, is your show. We're, we're new to this, so we're still going to figure out a bit of a flow and a bit of a structure and a bit of a format. We've got heaps of really cool questions from people, though, so we'll dig into them at some point. Um, we'll continue to put question and answer boxes out there and, and get your input, get your feedback, talk about what you want to hear about. Um, but, yeah, you have a bit of a weekly segment. Yeah, sweet. Oh, I'm, hey, we'll just do a quick we, uh, recap of how week's been so far. Okay. Anything exciting happening for the boys and girls? Ladies, CJ, you start. Um, not really. Uh, I, I'm prepping for the novice comp in April, Damn. which I'm really How keen exciting. for. Yes, so this whole block has been PBs, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, that's pretty much about. That's it. Just touching on that, uh, there's a bloke at the gym, Daniel uh, Lapitan. He uh, he's coming for you. He oh. he doesn't want you to be a stronger Filipino than him. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so there's a. Yeah, there's a little bit of a heated battle there. <laughs> well, hang on. Who's the current strongest Filipino in Zero? I'm pretty sure it's James. Nah, Nick Hodgson. Okay. Yeah. Nick Hodgson. I mean, he's had the best numbers ever. Is he currently the strongest? Nah, that's your boy. That's me. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think it's James. I think. Bridget, if you were to hedge bets on who's going to be the strongest Filipino by the end of 2022, whatever fucking year we're in. <laughs> This year, <laughs> who would it be? If he keeps up his training and does his accessories, it'll be CJ. All right, so the vote's on James. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about you, James? How's your week? It's good. It's good. Um, I'm deloading this week, so my training's pretty cruisy. Um, I've got some clients that are killing it at the moment. Big David Wilcock. Just want to give him a special mention. He's 60 the man. He's turning 61. And... I don't think I've ever coached someone that trains harder than him. So he comes in here every session. He actually wants to max out every session, but I say that's not how it works. But um, he's 61 years old, and this week he's done, you know, he's been doing deadlift, like triples at like 190, squat triples at 180, uh, bench like 105. It's pretty impressive. Mm. And he moves so well for a 61-year-old. 
he's a weapon. He loves it. But it, yeah, you're hundred percent right. He's a anyone who gets the pleasure of just watching him under the barbell. Uh, he's a real inspiration to train harder. Legend. How's your week been, Bridge? Good. Just yeah, helping you get all prepped for for states next month. It's been really exciting. It's, you've actually <laughs> done all the work, but no, that's I sweet. <laughs> you're killing it with Amber. Yeah, Amber. yeah, she's doing incredible. We had a really good squat session last night. She's come so far. Mm. Yeah. So Amber, uh, Amber, the stepdaughter of one of our longest members here, Steve Hampton. Uh, Steve is actually, yeah, currently one of the longest members we've ever had. He's from the Narang days. Um, Bridget started working with Amber late last year. Yeah. And Amber was uh, not strong enough at that point in time to push the empty leg press sled Mm -hmm. with two legs without assistance. Yeah. And now she's squatting and deadlifting and doing everything. Benching, she's doing the works. Looking awesome. You've done an amazing job with her. Thank you. I'm very proud of her. It's so cool. It never gets old. No matter who the client is, what their starting point is, seeing them progress never gets old. Never gets, never stops being cool to see how far people can mm. can go. Um, never gets old to see how much they enjoy it and how much value they, they get out of it. Um, it's really cool to see you guys reveling in that as well. How good. Mm. Um, what about you, Thomas? My week? Mm. It's been okay. Yeah? <laughs> it's been okay. Might have had a little bit of COVID last week. Um, Are you but back? As you do. Back, fighting, living another day. Voices may be a little bit husky, uh, but that's okay. Um, no, nah, life is good. Uh, we we had, uh, I went and oversaw an APL comp down in Melbourne on the weekend. Um, that went really smooth. Uh, this week we, we've got uh, APL states down in South Australia, so head down and and see that but really at the moment it's just getting ready f- to open zero brisbane just dealing with all the um uh the fun legal stuff you have to jump through all the all the hoops you have to jump through as part of leases and uh new buildings and all of that sort of stuff uh, but we've got all the equipment ready to go uh we're just waiting for the building to be finished off in terms of the renovations we're doing there then we build the gym our set opening date is march 23rd i believe it's that it's the Monday of that week, which is, let me check, March 21st is currently our official day one, uh, but we're hoping it's going to be a bit earlier than that. It just depends on the building works. Yeah, so if you're in Queensland and you're around on that date, definitely go there for the open day. It's going to be it's going to be hectic. I know all of us will make the trek up there. It's only about an hour from here, just over an hour, yeah. hour and 20. Um, no, fuck it, even if you're not in Queensland, just come yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, if you're in New Zealand, fly over, <laughs> South Africa, the Philippines... We want it all. Yeah, come through. Absolutely. Um, but I just wanted to, you just reminded me, Thomas, I wanted to talk about some uh, some grievances. I actually want to make this a weekly segment. Yes. I want you to air out your grievances. Who's pissed you off? Have I gone a day without pissing you off? <laughs> have I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like. Have I gone a day without pissing you off in three years? <laughs> if I think really hard, there's it's, it's bound to be one that slipped in there. One, one that slipped past the goalie where you didn't make a mistake. What was it? No, I'm kidding. Oh, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, you guys are amazing for the most part. Um, yeah, the grievance for the week. Now, many moons ago, we didn't have a coffee shop next to Ground Zero, uh, and I took a p- took it upon the kindness of my heart to bring in a uh, Nespresso pod machine for coffee for the staff members, of which there was one, James. And um, it sat there and it collected a lot of dust for many years to the point where I got really angry and I threw it out. Um, And then we got a coffee shop that's been providing us with coffee. We're sponsored by them. Great coffee, great people. Then today I walk in and there's a random pod machine in the gym. This is the grievance of the week. It's taking up space. It's going to gather dust. What say you? Yeah, you're not wrong. It will collect dust. <laughs> I was just sitting at home. And I was like, you know what? Let me uh, waste some s- more space at the gym. <laughs> Let me bring this in. Oh, Thomas leaves enough rubbish around the place. <laughs> Why don't we start bringing our own home rubbish here? Nah, it's sweet. Okay, that's a uh, that's not a bad grievance. Why do you keep saying grievance? <laughs> Is that the right word? Grievance. It's yeah. You grievance. Don't, don't don't say the e. I thought you were being funny the first time. Nah. But then you keep saying it. Your boy's just stupid. Nah, <laughs> not stupid. No, you're not. That's stupid. 
All right. Well, we got a bunch of questions. Um, we'll we'll use one as the main topic, and then uh, maybe do some quicker fire sort of stuff. Uh, so, what what do you think we should do for the main topic? Um, we'll cover the relationship with clients. Okay. Do you have the question? Yes, I do. Can you read it out? Let's start to discuss that. It's quite a long winded question. Just so I'll break it down. So, uh, another coach slash gym owner. Uh, They're having trouble with managing relationships with clients Uh, and, you know, knowing where to bridge uh, the gap between client and friend, uh, knowing where to bridge the gap between uh, the services they offer as well. Um, So they're talking about, you know, they feel like they're offering too much free service and no one's paying for the coaching because they're giving it to them for free already and it's not what they're doing and they're just trying to manage their – they don't know how to work around this and navigate around managing – their expectations, their clients' expectations, their gym members' expectations and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you've been doing this for, how long have you had gyms for now? 10 years. Yeah, so you'd be really good at this. You've probably had a million experiences, uh, good and bad. So you, you're you probably the most well-equipped to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, like, getting good at this is just the same as anyone else is going to get good at this sort of stuff that we don't get taught, which is you make a bunch of errors and you learn from your ways and, and get better at it. You suck at it for a while and then uh, the more you do it, the less you suck at it, right? Um, and I learned this the hard way through PTC initially. Like my original business model was you sign up to the gym as a member, you get your programming and coaching included. And the coaching consisted of the fact that I came here, I didn't have any online clients, I didn't do any of that, I didn't do any sort of education. All I did while I was at the gym was either sit behind the desk and watch YouTube or train. Um, and so when there were people in there, I just hung out with them, just hung out with them, taught them how to lift, showed them the ropes, looked after them through their sessions or trained with them. Um, and that was the coaching included as part of the membership. So completely informal. And there's a lot of value to doing that as a coach, whether you own a gym or not, like as a, as a PT, bringing on clients is very common strategy to give sessions away. There is some value in doing that. There's a lot of value as an online coach to talk to the the client a little bit more when you've got a very small client load and provide more value. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of good reason to do that. But unless that word that you touched on towards the end there, expectations, unless those expectations are very clear and managed well, then things are going to blow out of proportion because inevitably as you grow, things are going to change. Just like they did for me, Jim got bigger, people would come at different times. I had more in-person clients. I had more online work. So I couldn't commit as much time to everyone equally all the time. And that started to show. And so I had to remove that portion of the expectation. And that was quite a difficult transition to make. And this happens in in every level of coaching and in a lot of other service-based businesses as well. Like we'll talk to CJ in a second about it. But it's really easy um, to... uh, to give too much above and beyond expectation and to have the person lose sight of what the actual expectation was and then not realize what they are receiving is actually a bonus on top of what they're paying for. Um, This is something that you guys are going to have to learn as well because you make great connections with the people that you spend time with, right? You make great connections with your clients, with your online clients. It's, It's some of the best friends in the world that I have are through the lifting world. And some of the best friends I have in the world have been clients at some point. And inevitably, some people slip slip past the goalie like that. But for the most part, you really have to disconnect um, uh, the personal from the business. And that can be really quite difficult to do because before you know it, someone's texting you in the middle of the night, someone's burdening you with all their problems, and you don't actually know this person very well. Um, So I guess the, the biggest thing is you have to be really good at creating boundaries knowing when to shut down a conversation in a way that doesn't hurt the other person, knowing when to say, you know, that's something I think you really need to talk to something, someone about, or I'm really sorry to hear that, but uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I hope you've got people close in your life that you can talk to this about. Like you have to show that you care, but also show that you are not the person that is going to receive this. Otherwise that expectation becomes real and that's all you're going to get from that person. So yeah, CJ, I mean like, your work is a lot more personal than our work. Mm. Like when we are coaching people, we're, we're at least providing some direction and guidance and education as part of the process, whereas you're providing the service and literally the whole time it's just open slather for what you're going to talk about. How, how have you found it as uh, you know, a barber? How have you found it managing 
that line between people, you know, trying to become friends when you're really not offering that as part of your service. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, for me it was quite difficult because naturally I like deep connection mm. with people. Um, so for me it's it was knowing like is this something I should dig into or not? Like when people, you know, open up to me on the chair. Um, I think one of the first things that was uh, very, uh, yeah, good for me to learn early on, um, the Bible that taught me, even before I touched Clippers, he was saying, um, make sure, you know, whatever is said on the chair stays there and you don't take anything home. And that was like single, like piece, best piece of advice I got. So, um, and, and yeah, because being someone, yeah, who is naturally like that, um, like wanting deeper connection, it's very hard. Sometimes people are yeah, very vulnerable to you and you go home and you think, oh, you know, they've booked in again in a couple of weeks. Is this something I should bring up again? Or And immediately you have to kind of like shut that thinking off and know that it's not your responsibility. And, and it's easy like early on to feel bad um, to not be someone's support. You know, so um, I think what really helped with me um, is setting the right parameters in place um, with different boundaries. So um, as you guys know, I go to church and, um, you know, we have our services on Sunday, but throughout the week we meet up in smaller groups. And these are people that in a sense like you, you do life with them and it is intentionally – like intimate and you guys do have, um, I guess a sort of like camaraderie and that, that there's an open space for them to be more vulnerable for you. And as someone, yeah, you, there is like a level of counseling that you have to know about and whatnot. But even then the, like the boundaries are, I guess, deeper in that sense, but also you've got to know where your capabilities are and where your, um, qualifications are so uh, that that knowing that helped me heaps as well so very early on we were told you know hey if these issues come up you are not qualified to do this mm. you're there to love on these people care about them but this is not for you to walk through them so you've got to set very clear boundaries for like hey i love you i'm i'm supporting you like i'm always here but this is not something i can walk you through you need to seek help or whatever um, and knowing that coming to the barbershop, that helps big time because, um, I guess when you understand, like in the big picture, you're actually caring for the person, I guess for me, naturally wanting to have, like be more nurturing for people, you're actually doing them a bigger favor than trying to be their hero. For sure. So, um, I guess it's for me is getting that full understanding that, yeah, you don't, have to be the hero in everyone's story um like you 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 can show that you like you say you can show that you care about people but you don't have to be the one that walks them through everything and to set those boundaries in place because then also you're protecting yourself Mm. in a huge way and it's it we never get taught this stuff so Mm. like a lot of people just have to figure it out it's kind of like look at it like first aid You know, like when you guys do a first aid course, the thing they labor the most is here's how you save someone. But if someone's dying, you don't have to save them. Like if if you see someone, you are not obliged to have to go and help that person, which sounds really harsh. But like in the moment, some people are going to freak out and have panic attacks and anxiety and are not actually equipped to be the hero, to be the paramedic in that situation. Um, And so they do a lot of, I guess, pre-counseling to prevent people from having guilt around like I was there and I didn't step in. It's like, maybe you didn't have the confidence to do so. Maybe if you tried to do so, you would have made the situation worse. And it's very much the same with this. Like, you know, I, I pick my staff, I pick you guys based on who you are as people, not who you are as coaches. Cause the coaching side is easy. You know, twist your quads away from each other fucking problem solved. That part's easy. Being able to connect with someone, make them feel safe, make them feel comfortable in an environment that can be otherwise intimidating, that's really hard. So you guys are amazing with people. And one thing that comes with being amazing with people is people love you. And so they just want to tell you everything. They just want to connect with you. They want to be around you because you're great people. 
And so like one thing we all need to hear, I'm not a great person, but you guys are. One thing we all need to hear is, hey, you don't have to be everyone's friends. Like it's not part of your job to be everyone's friends. Um, and so, you know, to the person asking the question, that's something you have to think about. Like I don't actually have to be best friends with this person. And I can, like CJ was just saying, I can show them love. I can show them care. I can give them what they need from a service-based perspective without becoming their best friend. Once you've created that expectation, it's a little bit harder to go back in the other direction, but that just comes from having a real conversation with someone. I think when you worked at Converse, you know, it was never part of your job to be like, oh, yeah, buy these shoes and then we'll go grab a coffee. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, still, uh, I still look at it that way kind of. So, you know, when, at the end of the day, for me, at the end of the day, it's still just a business transaction. For sure. While I'm under this roof uh, working, servicing clients. Um, while, although it is a business transaction, I want them to get the most out of their transaction. I want to, you know, give them a really high quality level of service, whether it's online or face-to-face. But at the end of the day, it, that's all it is. It's a mm. business transaction. I've got friends outside of here. Mm. Um, you know, I've got friends that I love. I've got other relationships um, that mean more to me than a business transaction, mm. essentially. Yeah. I mean, you're newest to this, Bridget. Like, your, your previous work was very much one-sided and probably a lot of people wanted to be friends with you and there was never a temptation to be friends with a drunk, fucking idiot <laughs> um how have you found it like in terms of uh, because again you're such a lovable person people want to be around you um how have you found this transition into spending time one-on-one -on -one with people that want to be around you naturally i like to think of myself as a very caring person and a compassionate person so at the moment i just like to try and help people and be there for them as much as i possibly can but i haven't had to experience it like at that level yet where I think it's sort of getting out of my control. So yeah, I'm not really sure how I'll deal with that if it, and when it happens. It'll come. <laughs> Sometimes the only way to learn how to deal with a situation like that is by experiencing it. Yeah. Like even though I was lucky enough, like we're all lucky enough, but I had Thomas as a mentor. So, you know, he'd give me scenarios and he'd be able to guide me through certain things. So I kind of had a rough idea what to do, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, like he can tell me all that and, it doesn't mean anything until it actually happens. Yeah. It's it's tricky because like, again, we're all caring people. We're all altruistic. We want to help people. We want people to feel good. And so if someone comes to you in strife or you know that someone is in strife, your natural knee jerk reaction is to help them out. And you just have to think like, am I the person I can help them out, but am I the person that needs to help them out? And what implications does this create if I do help them out? if you can kind of step back and look at the bigger picture objectively and remove the emotion of wanting to help in that situation, it kind of helps you disconnect from that emotion and see it a little bit more for what it is as a business transaction. Uh, otherwise you find yourself getting involved in all these situations and you're like, why am I putting so much energy and effort into this person that doesn't actually uh, belong in my life in this capacity? And that, that's, it sounds harsh, but it, that's the reality of it. Again, we're not going to have absolute close friends with every single client that that comes through the door um and there are ways to make the person feel loved and cared about and satisfy that altruistic caring nature that we have without crossing the line of like coach client relationship and making things hard for yourself and for them as well because it comes confusing for themselves if you're being this friend or this mentor or this uh rock for this person um and it's not necessarily reciprocated you know, you don't see them in your life the same way that they see you in, in their life. Uh, that becomes really confusing for the person on the other end as well. So we do have to be careful uh, in our roles with with what we do in that regard. It becomes really hard to manage as well. Like if you become a busy coach and you've got 100 clients and uh, instead of 100 clients, you've got 100 friends, it's a lot of friends to be managing. It's a lot of messages to be managing. And, and I mean, like to, to add to this one tip you know, people will message you when they think about you or when they think about what they're thinking to tell you. And if that's at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night and their check-in day is Friday or their session day is Friday, you're under no obligation to reply to that. And if you do reply to that at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night and go back and forth, that opens the door to the expectation. This person is here and they can talk to me. Um, we have to be careful with how we deal with 
online and written communication like text messages, emails, you know, social media messages, uh, because it's very easy to create that expectation. And naturally, if we are sitting there doing nothing and we get a message, we want to respond to it. You have to be good at being like, this isn't the right time to do this because it sends a message to the person, um, like a metaphorical message to the person as to what I'm willing to be for them. Maybe I just need to leave this alone for tonight and answer it tomorrow or answer it in a couple of days. You know, maybe, maybe that's the way we need to look at things as well. It's hard because there's all these unwritten rules that exist that we're never taught, that we're never shown, that we just have to figure out on the only way that we can figure out really quickly, like James said, is to just fuck it up a bunch of times or be exposed to conversations like this. Sweet. That's a good answer. Any more comments on that subject? I could talk about that subject all day. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you pretty much uh, summed it all up there. That's pretty good. Nice. Sweet. Let's rip into some questions, eh? Sounds good. All right. Gitch, hook me up with the phone. All right. We got heaps of, uh, <laughs> there's, we got lots and lots of questions. So we're not going to get through all of them today, but I'm just going to pick out a few. Um, so the first question is top five albums of all time. And this is from my uh, beautiful fiance, Alicia Gormack. Love you, baby. No, no, no. <laughs> all right. So top five albums of all time. Uh, CJ, we'll start with you. Oh, man. Um, flip. Bob Marley. No, no. Uh, gr- growing up, I was obsessed with Coldplay. So three of them are probably Coldplay. Yeah. Um, I'll, okay, I'll say um, A Rush of Blood to the Head, Parachutes, X and Y. They're all by Coldplay. I love... Um, um, Random Access Memories by Daft Punk. Nice, I that's that a good one. that was such a good album. And P.O.D. No, <laughs> no. All time favorite rap album has to be 2001. Ooh, Very nice. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Good. Good, your dog. Uh, Top five albums. These Evan are in no particular order. They're just ones that I can <laughs> <laughs> that I can listen to like back to back without skipping a song. Uh, and Justice for All, Metallica. Yeah, Vulgar Display of Power by Pantera. Oh, great album. <laughs> uh, uh, what else? I uh, love my EDM. So, The Prodigy, The Fat of the Land. Uh, Super Unknown, Soundgarden. Fantastic album. I've been listening to that a lot lately. And uh, Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I got tickets to see them this year. I can't wait. Great choices. <laughs> wait, and you were going to do your, your shout out as well? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, System of a Down, Toxicity. Nice. Wait, I'll mention. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thomas, top five albums. See, this is... Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 soundtrack. <laughs> Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 soundtrack. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is tricky. I, I feel like this is easier for, for Bridget and CJ than it is for us. Mm based on the very large generational gaps. So, like... <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> Between me and Bridget? Yeah, because you're 12 and she's like 60. <laughs> I'm 12. And me and James are in the middle. So, like, first, first start, <clears throat> like, Bridget actually bought albums, like the vinyl albums, mm. and they... The vinyl. <laughs> and they had to do, like, yeah. the wind-up, yeah. you know... Like her record. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The Sixties were a crazy time, man. <laughs> Absolutely, but like we we had CDs, but I like when I started getting independent about music, I was just downloading it off LimeWire and Kazaa, song by song, not album by album. And so I I've only actually ever owned four albums in my entire life, like four CDs. Otherwise, I just made MP3 CD mixes, um, and then I got Spotify and I listened by artist and artist radio. So. I had to look up what the albums would be if they were top five. Um, so number one, Symphony X, The Odyssey. Why is that funny, Bridget? <laughs> I don't wow. make fun of your music. <laughs> no, it's a good album. I do make fun of your music. It's okay. Um, number two, let's go Elton John by Elton John. It's the same artist and the same name for those of you who are unfamiliar with Elton John. He's relatively obscure. Um, what else did I say? Uh, Thursday Full Collapse. It's like an emo band. I had the other Pretty two sure before. Queen was in there, weren't they? 
No, I didn't have Queen no. on the list. I had two more. You go, James, while I think of the others. You, did you mention an emo band? Yeah. If you guys want to see a photo of emo Thomas, <laughs> can you please uh, write it in the comments and we might post it, possibly, no. if I still have a job. <laughs> I might not have a job by then. We definitely will not ever post that photo. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Uh, my top five albums of all time. This one's an easy one for me. Uh, I'm a hip-hop head. I'm a hip-hop baby. Uh, top five albums. Number one is Life After Death, Notorious B.I.G. I can listen to that front mm. to back, back to front. I don't go to that album for a particular song. I can listen to anything on that album. Uh, number two, The Carter Two, Lil Wayne. Uh, I grew up in the... I'm born in 91, so I feel like Lil Wayne was really dominant when I was in high school. Like He was like the biggest rapper, so I'm a massive Lil Wayne fan. Number three, Pharrell On My Mind. When I was a kid, I used to try dress like Pharrell, so... He was like a massive inspo for me. Still is. I still love that guy. Did you wear a fedora? No, but I wore like the full zip up hoodies and like the colorful sunnies. I wore like a skate belt hanging out, trucker to the side, I, diamond earrings. Yeah, I thought I was Pharrell. Um, number four is The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. That's like a all time favorite album for me as well. Classic. And number five is Shefu. <laughs> Not Shafu. Scribe. I was honestly going to put Scribe the Crusader in there. Damn. Like, that was like a pivotal time in our lives. Like, you know, coming into our teenage years, especially coming from Christchurch. That's where me and Thomas is from. Um, but nah, my fifth favorite album would probably be uh, Bryson Tiller, Trap Soul. Nice. Mm. So they're my albums. I have no idea who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most of what you guys said was no idea. Um, I'll chuck in Grace, Jeff Buckley. Um, and I'll think of a fifth one. Sweet. I did. I came up with five before you did. Uh, with Bridget you did. as my witness. I, ca mm -hmm. I just can't think of the fifth one right now. That's all right. We'll come back to you. We'll come back. All right. Um. <clears throat> well, I like. So I mostly listen to classical piano, and that's not a lie or trying to sound edgy or whatever. That's genuinely, if you get in my car and music's playing, it's almost definitely going to be classical piano. And so, like, it's not like Beethoven dropped the hottest. Hottest album of 1742 or whatever. <laughs> they didn't have albums. So favorite music versus favorite album. It's tricky. Fair enough. All right. Uh, next question is, this one's for uh, Brent Warland, uh, big bench presser from, uh, is he from Melbourne? Yeah. I had yeah. breakfast with him on the weekend. He's the man, eh? Good cool man. dude. Uh, so he's been Team Zero forever. His question is, how's Kung Fu Henny dealing with the ever-growing fanfare? Look, it's hard, man. <laughs> It's hard. I just got to try to stay grounded, stay hump. Nah, there is no fanfare. Um, we just, yeah, I don't know. We just talk shit every day. You're have fun. Popular. You're all going to get popular now that you're out there with the mm. with the podcast. At, at, I went to Strength Culture on Friday and um, they were all asking what to call you. They're like, we just call him Kung Fu. What does he <laughs> like to be called? And I'm like, just call him James. Like, really? We've always just called him Kung Fu. Yeah, lots of people don't actually know my name. People call me Kenny <laughs> yeah. or Henny, and that's cool because I guess that is my Instagram name. But um, yeah, Brett Warland, uh, yeah, it's, man, it's hard in these streets. You know, I can't even remember my own name sometimes, but no, nah, it's all good. Well, I love it. Explain to people in between like your stories of fame, explain to people <laughs> why you arrived at the Instagram hand, handle of Kung Fu Henny. Oh, so Kendrick Lamar is one of my favorite rappers ever. His nickname is Kung Fu Kenny. So I changed my Instagram name to Kung Fu Henny. And somehow people still call me Kenny. Like they don't actually know it's an H. So that's how I came to the Instagram name, uh, Kung Fu Henny. But I'm thinking about a rebrand. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Champagne Henny. Champagne <laughs> oh Henny. Gosh. Yeah, just like my boy Drake. <laughs> Drake. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. We're going to get a lot of mail from Tom Hardy about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I, I act a little, I'm 30 years old, 30 years old going on 16, but it is what it is. <laughs> All right, next question is, this one is from one of my clients, an all-round legend, Anthony Zapapas from Tasmania. Uh, reasons for a lifter to choose between sumo and conventional and the benefits of both. Oh, there you go. I, if this question gets asked so much and I think people are looking for a complicated answer. The answer is pretty simple. It's like if you pull 200 conventional and 250 sumo as your answer. Like ultimately, if you're in powerlifting, the answer is which one can you pull more 
in at that point in time. That doesn't necessarily mean, because I, I guess, you know, the inherent assumption in the question is like, how do I pick which one is going to be better for me? Not which one is better for me right now. And I think a lot of people think it's to do with like <coughs> limb lengths or biomechanics or something like that. Really, it's just skill. Like once you learn the skill of both of them, um, which one are you stronger at and which one do you enjoy more um, is, is really going to be the answer. So it's, it's kind of a boring answer to the question. Um, but there's some stuff that goes with it. Like sumo is quite a difficult skill to learn. Most people that just pick it up, stand wider and start pulling. And this provides a benefit if you really suck at conventional because it helps you hide what's wrong with your conventional. The thing with sumo and conventional is if you're missing something in one of the lifts or if you're missing something in your conventional, it's still going to be an issue in your sumo. You might be able to mask it a little bit and push through some barriers, but it's still going to be a problem that you need to address. And so one of the best ways to improve your sumo deadlift is with a conventional. So if you switch to sumo, just make sure you're not doing it for the purpose of running away from conventional uh, and make sure you're honing in the skill of it. Um, otherwise, it can it can quickly be um, quite negative. You can beat up your hips by standing wide and not stabilizing them and putting lots of load through them. You can beat up your back by not supporting it properly or just pulling with your back, and now you've just shortened the range of motion by standing wide. Like, There's still issues that can arise with a sumo, but it is quite a difficult skill, um, and that's what people struggle to wrap their heads around, I think. Yeah, I was just going to say you should practice both, mm. um, if, especially if you want to train for a long time, you know, if you think about longevity as well, you don't want to be uh, subjected to the same three lifts your entire life. You want to practice both. So they're good skills to have. And like Thomas said, they benefit each other. If you pull sumo, you should probably pull conventional as well. If you pull conventional, um, you probably don't have to, but if you want to practice sumo, you should probably learn how to do it and learn how to do it properly. Like you said, Thomas, it beats up your hips. Um, for a long time, I had really bad hip pain um, just because I did a butchered kind of sumo uh, because I, at the time I couldn't conventional when I first uh, came to zero because I snapped my Achilles twice, so I had like zero dorsiflexion. Um, so that's how I got into sumo. But yeah, the, at the moment, my uh, training's going really good and I think it's partly because I'm actually pushing my conventional as well. Mm. Yeah, that's that. Sweet. Anyone else? CJ, you only pull conventional because yeah. you're a mad dog. No, I, yeah, I have not even tried pulling sumo ever in my life. I don't know. I'm, it would be cool to learn, I guess. Um, I don't know if my hips would even allow. Most people that learn a real sumo, it's enough for them to say, okay, I'm never doing sumo. <laughs> like, okay. That's that's the reality of it. That That's also like the people that say, I'm switching to sumo because it's easier. And they do it and they're like, yep, well, that was just the conventional with your legs wide apart. Yeah, sumo is infinitely harder than Way conventional. Harder. From a skill perspective, for sure. Um, all right, this one's from Jamie Smith from Melbourne Strength Culture. I love this guy, by the way. Uh, what was your first year of lifting? What your first year of lifting was like, and what feelings do you remember about those initial moments? Gidge, you got an answer for us? I was completely clueless. Yeah, um, originally just joined the gym because I wanted to grow my legs, wanted to grow my glutes, but then I found this love for getting stronger, and I just pursued that. I found a coach who started teaching me how to squat, how to deadlift, and yeah, went from there. So, yeah. talk us through. Talk us through, like, you started going to the gym. You went it alone. No guidance whatsoever at the start. Uh, I did the sign-up that you do at most commercial gyms where you get, like, a couple of free PT sessions. Okay. So they, they showed you the ropes? Yeah. Yeah. So I was being coached by uh, this brand-new 19-year-old personal trainer. Thought, you know, he was, like, the greatest thing ever. And, uh, yeah, then ended up finding another coach after about six months because he ended up leaving the gym and this guy wanted to teach me how to deadlift. And I remember trying to deadlift. I think we had the little plastic 2.5 kilo yeah. plates on the side. Yeah, yeah. And I just had no idea what I was doing. I was trying to pull the bar up with my arms like this. But yeah, but eventually got better, started getting stronger and just fell in love with it. So so wait, because you just skipped six months again. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you did these couple of sessions with the PT. Yeah, and, and then did you just start making up your own thing? Like, did you just go to the gym and just play? On oh no, I trained with this personal trainer for the six months oh, until he okay. left the gym. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but we weren't doing any of the main lifts. We were just doing yeah a bunch of accessories and yeah yeah. And, w and what does the question say? Like, t talk us through some of the the feelings. Like, how did you? Yeah. So, what feelings 
do you remember about those initial moments? I when I first joined, I was terrified. Yeah, absolutely terrified. I hadn't stepped foot in a gym before until about seven years ago. So um, I was really intimidated for a long time. I wouldn't go to the gym unless I had a session with him. And then uh, when I started coaching with this new personal trainer, it wasn't at a gym. It was actually outside, like at his home gym. And then we'd, we'd do a lot of the training outdoors. So I was a lot more relaxed then. But, um, yeah, just fell in love with getting stronger. I remember getting excited every time. I hit a new PB, still feel the same, but yeah, hmm. yeah, it was great. What about you, CJ? Tell us about last week. <laughs> <laughs> last week when I started lifting. <laughs> Again. He started Again. doing accessories for the first time last <laughs> week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why his session's taking seven hours. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> instead, of, instead of six and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so what was the question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what your first year of lifting was like and what feelings oh, do you remember about those initial moments? Um, gosh, first year of lifting. Yeah. Yeah. Very clueless. Didn't know, very out of place. Didn't know what I was doing. Um, like up until, yeah, that point, I only started lifting like a few years ago, four or five years ago. Um, but before that, like I played a lot of sports. I'm um, growing up and yeah, footy, even cricket in the off season, did boxing, but I never, yeah, went to the gym and lifted. So when I stopped playing sports, I figured I need to do some form of exercise and um, yeah, going to the gym. Yeah. It's very daunting. Um, yeah. You, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know how many accessories you're meant to be doing and you know, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I, uh, then I, um, funnily enough, the guy that taught me how to cut hair, my barber, he was the one that started getting into my head that, you know, you should try getting strong because that's cool. And, and you know, a practical strength <laughs> that you can uh, apply. And then, yeah, he took me to his home gym and taught me how to do the three compound lifts, the three, yeah, bench, squat, and dead. And, and to me, that was more fun than machines because these actually take skill. And there's a game to it. And and then naturally I was, I guess, kind of strong at it. So I thought, oh, this is, I'm actually kind of good at this. And when you feel you're kind of good at something, it excites you all of a sudden. You think you can do something about it. And yeah, I remember just falling down YouTube rabbit holes and <laughs> oh yeah, f- fell in love with like strong men at first. And I, I loved Brian Shaw, so I deadlifted like him. <laughs> so I had a really wide stance and... <laughs> held the bar really wide and um and then I remember when I first started coming to this gym I was like oh I can actually be myself here and use chalk because you know the conventional gym uh, the uh, commercial gyms I went to didn't allow that so I could use chalk and oh my gosh it's so embarrassing um I didn't realize that in videos when you saw people with powder on their legs <laughs> that it was talc <laughs> So I remember chalking up my shins. <laughs> and I still have footage of it. And I had such a wide stance when I deadlifted that like the knurling was scraping my shins and it was bleeding so much. And I was just, I just, I remember rocking up to the gym. Kieran was training and he was like testing all his lifts. So that was a big like humble pie for me to eat, <laughs> to see this young kid just pulling insane weight off the ground and benching huge numbers and, I'm just like loading the bar up with bumpers and <laughs> pulling a heavy single <laughs> and um or to me it was a heavy single um but yeah even in that like even in talking to Kieran I was like the first time of training here and I had no program at the time he was very like welcoming and didn't look down on me for being so much weaker than him and I thought oh like we're all on the same page here we're all in our own journey getting stronger and um that's what, yeah, immediately I felt like, okay, there's camaraderie here. Like there's a um, community here that, yeah, we're all on the same journey. And yeah, I was just hooked. Yeah. Thomas? Man, I have so many stories from my time in like starting out lifting and going to commercial gyms. But I'll keep it short. Uh, I, I started lifting at home, so I'm not going to count that. I'm going to start like count my first year of lifting at commercial gym. So I joined a gym when I was like, I think I was 15, just just before I turned 16. <clears throat> my, my commercial gym was real cool. Like the, I trained at 5.30 in the morning when it opened just before school. 
And the morning crew was just a, like a bunch of these older dudes just doing their thing, trying to get jacked. I'd bought um, Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. So I followed the advice in that, which was three times a week I would do 45 minutes of calves at the end of my session. And the other three times a week I'd do 45 minutes of forearms at the end of my session. The 45 minutes of calves worked. <laughs> the thing is I never had big calves until I got fat and started walking buddy. <laughs> I never had calves until like two years ago. Um, it didn't work back then. I can promise you that. Uh, but I have great memories. Like I, I remember within four weeks, I started trying to learn how to squat on the Smith machine. And within four weeks, I was like, this doesn't feel right. So I switched to barbell squats and I was doing bench and deadlifts. Um, but the old guys around me were really supportive. They were always like sort of giving, giving me advice, um, encouraging me, that kind of stuff. It was probably terrible advice. Uh, I, I look back as well. This is this one dude. And every time I was leaving, he was having a shower and he would like have his shirt off getting ready to get into the shower. And I'd, I'd walk into the changing rooms and I'd see him with his shirt off and see these lats and triceps and arms and be like, this guy is larger than life. Like I have to look like this one day. I'd be really curious as an adult now, having been exposed to this world for so much longer and being bigger now myself to see how big he actually was. Like if he was actually big or just like a regular dude that went to the gym. Um, but yeah, I have, I have great memories of, of lifting I remember inviting my friend once and as you walked up to the stairs to the weight room, there was an incline bench and I'd just done a drop set on incline bench and I unracked 40 kilos and dropped it on like my chest near my neck and my friend walked up and I was just dying there. <laughs> it was great. What about you? Um, I got two, I guess you can say two first exposures to the gym. Uh, so the first exposures weren't enjoyable because we had to go for footy. So for rugby league, we had to do an hour of gym before like a, our session before our field based session and all we did was me and my friends we'd go we'd do a one rep max squat we'd do a ru- one rep max bench press we'd finish with some bicep curls and some power cleans and then there were boxing gloves in the gym so we'd always put them on and fight after it <laughs> so we did this every week that's all we did uh so it was it sucked because we you know we didn't want to be there we we're like 15 16 years old and uh the boxing was fun at the end of it um and we'd literally put the gloves on and just start swinging at each other headshots and everything Sick. And then uh, my second exposure was probably when I was like 19 or 20 uh, when I really got into, I guess you could say, proper strength training or bodybuilding, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> my Someone used to, I used to hang out with, she dragged me to the gym and said, you need to start going to the gym. I was like, yeah, sweet, whatever. And I had Mesomorph, which is a pre-workout. Damn. And that literally changed my life. Like that set the trajectory to where I am today. I had this pre-workout and I remember I trained for like four and a half hours. <laughs> I did my whole body and I called in sick the next day to work because I was so run down and beat up. And then ever since, th- like then I, all I did was, because uh, I guess we didn't really have much information on proper training back then. So I used to watch like Kai Green videos and uh, yeah. Phil Heath videos and I just do whatever they did. Yep. So I did like those Jefferson squats and things like that, that Kai Green did. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that was my uh, two exposures to training. My... Um my journey into supplements, I was a BSN boy. So I used to do the full BSN stack. You'd have NO Explode before training. And then this stuff called Nitrix. You'd have three before, three during, and three after. And then you'd have Cell Mass, which was like the creatine formula after. Then I'd have um, Cyvation Extend and Concrete, <laughs> which was like another creatine during the workout. And a protein shake. It had to be optimum nutrition after the after the workout but it it ended up being like four or five shakes <laughs> across a lot of water and i used to do a driving lesson straight after the gym so like i'd have all this fluid and then get in an hour driving lesson would be 10 minutes in and i'm like when my, my driving instructor's name was carlos he'd be saying like we need to do a u-turn at the intersection <laughs> i'd be like carlos we need a we need to find a mcdonald's right now i need to use a toilet and we'd have to stop like sometimes three times during the driving lesson because i drank way too much so as a solution i used to mix all of them together so it'd be like a fruity a fruity flavored um bcaas plus this other fruity flavored creatine formula plus like a chocolate protein <laughs> in just a little bit of water to turn into this like horrific sludge of supplements just so I didn't pee my pants during my driving lessons. 
That's good. I was an optimum nutrition man. I loved Steve Cook back then. <laughs> he was I, the man. I uh, I met him once. Yeah? Yeah, he was standing behind me in a very long line to go to the toilet <laughs> at, at the Columbus uh, Arnold's. It was because uh, I didn't know who he was. I knew he was famous. I turned around. I'm like, I recognize this guy. Who is he? And I, I don't know fitness influences. So I like it. I worked out after who it was, but it was cool because he had to wait in line with me for ages. Um, and it was a cool reminder afterwards to be like, oh, you're a fitness influencer with millions of followers, but you still have to wait in line to take a piss with me. Just another human. Just another guy. Exactly. Um, all right. We've got a couple more. Um, Might just do one more. We're one sort more. of getting to the end of time. Yeah, sweet. All right. One more. This one's from Meg Kimura. If you had to pick an actor to play out your life in a movie, who would it be? Uh, a young Katie Holmes. Oh, yeah. why is that? Uh, I used to get told I looked like her a lot when I was younger, but I just as a person, I think she's really great. She's very humble, very down to earth. Yeah, I like her a lot. Thomas? Tom Hardy. Ooh. Wait, the one from Warwick? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes. T Hardy. Shout out T Hardy. Uh, CJ? Uh, Denzel Washington? Yeah, oh, nice. nice. I like that. Uh, mine would be uh, Michael B. Jordan because he's the hottest bloke on earth. <laughs> Absolutely. Surely no other reason. And he's got a mad rig. He's in hectic shape. Mm. He is. He is. Um, that's it for today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the first run. It's kind of the first run. The first recorded run. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Please rate us five stars. That helps us get out there a little bit more. We're going to keep asking questions. We want to know what you want to hear us talk about. So please let us know that and we will uh, endeavor to bring you the kind of content that you want to see from us. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to doing this across this year, which is what we said at the end of the last one, but here we are again. <laughs> we're, um, and like I said, like Thomas mentioned before, we're still working on this, so it's only going to get better. Uh, the structure of our episodes is only going to get better. Uh, we're going to get more comfortable talking behind microphones. Our layout's going to get better. We're getting more chairs. Uh, we're still working on the setup. We've got the beautiful backdrop now that uh, Thomas's brother Johnny did. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it's only going to get better. So keep blowing this up. Keep sharing it. Keep showing the love. Uh, keep tagging us. We all love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, we're trying to grow this thing huge. This is one of the things I'm looking most forward to growing in 2022. Sick. Sweet. Okay. See you.